We'll do our best to answer these questions throughout the session, but we will have time for Q&A session for the end of the webinar. So without further delay, I will present you our host for today. First, Valentina Alario, who is the Head of Product and Solutions Marketing at Plumgrid, and John Jainchik, Technical Solutions Marketing Manager at Marantis. John is going to kick up the session today, so over to you, John. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I uh, am going to be introducing today's session by talking a little bit about OpenStack, which is what Marantis does. Um, uh, OpenStack uh, is, uh, well, as the slide says, uh, a little confusingly, I think, it's a, a set of interfaces that abstract APIs for drivers across infrastructure components. Um, but I, I think I have a better explanation uh, for what it is. Uh, it's a... Uh, uh, it's an open source cloud framework. Um, it comprises a, a growing list of sub projects that coordinate the components of an open cloud stack like hypervisors and containers, like virtual network components and services, virtual storage components, operating systems, compute storage and network hardware, orchestration, telemetry, measurement. And these coordinating components, which have names like Nova Compute and Cinder Block Storage and Neutron Network, use drivers to adapt them to specific uh, infrastructure and solutions. Uh, collectively, they help OpenStack allocate data center resources to serve tenants and workloads. Um, now, on top of these services, OpenStack provides a set of REST APIs, and these APIs are accessed remotely by a web UI called Horizon, which is fairly comprehensive and sufficient for manual uh, cloud operations. Um, also, uh, it can be accessed conveniently from anywhere uh, via a set of more comprehensive command line clients written in Python. Um, and then additionally, uh, by uh, means of associated uh, SDKs, so uh, your, um, your language or scripting um, methodology of choice uh, can be accommodated directly and talk to OpenStack. All of this stuff is very useful for managing cloud operations, for diagnosing what's going on with a cluster, and for automating basic tasks with infrastructure. But the APIs obviously are useful for more uh, than uh, you know, than just uh, writing little scripts that start uh, ten or twenty virtual machines. Um, they can be harnessed by orchestrators like uh, the OpenStack project Heat, which um, lets you template, um, uh, store templates in uh, repos and revision control code that enables more complex deployments, including ones that auto scale. There are also uh, vagrant providers, for example, for OpenStack, which work very well. Uh, providers for um, for other installation and cloud management uh, um, uh, command line systems and uh, uh, and uh, uh, higher level orchestrators like uh, Bosch from Cloud Foundry um, and other tools. The the orchestrators um, Heat, for example, can in turn be harnessed by higher order tools like the Murano Application Catalog, uh, which is a Marantis independent open source a project that enables self-service delivery of containerized apps and, and prepackaged environments. Um, and then they can be uh, harnessed by platform as a service solutions like Cloud Foundry, which uh, virtualize the IAS cloud um, and enable uh, highly abstracted, efficient delivery and lifecycle management of cloud-native containerized web apps. Customers choose OpenStack, well, for a variety of reasons. And the URL at the bottom of this slide shows um, a very interesting survey that was conducted um, through most of last year by the OpenStack Foundation that clarifies both why people chose OpenStack at the beginning of the year and why they were choosing OpenStack at the end of the year. There's been significant movement from um, from uh, smaller uh, implementations, experimental proofs of concept, to large uh, and production scale uh, implementations in a lot of places. Last year was a real watershed year for uh, for the project uh, in the enterprise uh, service provider and other key spaces. Um, what people are looking for, well, obviously, um, what we're what we're saying is is that they prioritize cost savings. Um, uh, and, and certainly there are cost savings to be gained by using uh, open source uh, cloud solutions. Um, although it's easy to overestimate and or misestimate and project those costs um, long term. Um, cost, however, is not the fundamental mover. The fundamental mover is, um, is flexibility, uh, openness, that is to say freedom from lock-in, uh, and increased operational efficiency. Um, where we see in our own uh, implementations, um, uh, people, um, uh, people assigning value is, is 
first um, at the lowest level among developers who are looking for uh, solutions that will let them spin up uh, their own uh, environments, um, explore uh, integrated environments that uh, that abstract away the mechanics of, uh, of uh, cloud uh, and infrastructure operations in the course of delivering dev QA test uh, and ultimately production um, uh, sequences. We see a lot of uh, interest in what's been called CICD, continuous deliver, uh, continuous integration, continuous uh, delivery. Basically, people people want to do stuff without worrying about underlying mechanics. They want to take advantage of APIs uh, and abstractions uh, to 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 turn the the functions of the cloud into a true commodity. And this has historically, in recent years, been something that people have accomplished with services like AWS, um, but are finding that they can do with greater uh, customizability and uh, and uh, uh, flexibility and ultimately power with uh, with OpenStack. Above that layer, of course, there are the IT people uh, who are responsible for putting systems in place um, and responding to the demands of developers, uh, which can be uh, imperious. Uh, and they want to improve their productivity too uh, and uh, are looking at uh, automation uh, and platform as a service uh, as ways of, uh, of facilitating uh, the delivery of, uh, of uh, uh, ready to roll um, dev QA test and ultimately production environments, uh, as well as uh, the ability to dynamically scale environments to, to, to meet user demand. And finally, business leaders of various kinds are looking for ways to, to, uh, to escape historic lock-in factors that have, uh, that have dominated their choice in, uh, in data center uh, solutions um, and to react in more agile ways to industry and customer demands. Um, they want to be able to add resources quickly. They want to be able to grow their, grow their clouds up or indeed scale them back sometimes to, to, uh, to, to meet demand accurately. And uh, they want to be able to serve what are ultimately turning out to be hard to anticipate developer needs. There's a great deal of ferment now in uh, developer tool design, tool chain design um, that needs to be accommodated somehow. And uh, OpenStack is proving to be the way that a lot of companies are going to do this. Um, I don't want to dwell too much on this slide um, because I think that we are all at this point and should be primed to filter hype out. But it's worth noting that over the past couple of years, um, uh, since the inception of several uh, large-scale open source cloud um, projects, that uh, OpenStack has been the the has has emerged uh, in the past two years, at least, as uh, as uh, a consistently dominating and consistently growing um, phenomenon. Um, it's a very large project. There's over 1,500 people now contributing. Um, a lot of organizations, um, a lot of companies, including my own, uh, in the number three spot with the last revision of uh, OpenStack called Juno, uh, contributed a great deal of code. Um, and a lot of vendors are creating um, uh, plugins and drivers and uh, and uh, add-ons uh, so that uh, user choice is actually being um, uh, being emphasized um, as the project vision said. Uh, you know, it should be a little bit about us. Um, Morantis is a uh, it's actually a fairly old company, but came to uh, came to the OpenStack market as OpenStack. Uh, became a, a, a project, and OpenStack is now all that Mirantis does. Um, we have over 600 engineers um, uh, who spend, uh, the majority of whom spend uh, a great deal of their time, and many of them full-time, contributing to the project itself. Uh, we start projects that have been accepted by the OpenStack Foundation, in fact, as recently as last night. The confirmation of our rally project for telemetry was uh, was uh, uh, distributed around the company, something we're very proud of. We are, are probably the only pure play uh, OpenStack company in the market. Uh, the other contributors, um, although they do a, a great deal of work, have other concerns. Um, they may have proprietary products or, or, uh, or uh, other angles on um, participation in OpenStack. Um, so we are uniquely concerned with advancing OpenStack as a as a, a, a method for, um, for, for creating dynamic uh, clouds and promoting user choice. Where we focus a lot of our effort is on a, a product called uh, Fuel, which is a deployment and management engine for OpenStack. Um, 
our work consists of following OpenStax every six month release cycle by uh, working on um, uh, by, by creating a distribution uh, which incorporates uh, the core OpenStack code and related projects uh, and select plugins and drivers from partners, as well as um, a, a great deal of what we call a configurational hardening code. The, the configurational hardening is, is the result of a great deal of uh, experience that Mirantis has implementing clouds for customers. We know how to install OpenStack um, on a wide variety of hardware and have been very good over many years in uh, maintaining databases of, uh, of uh, configuration methodologies and specifics. And all of this intelligence is worked into the configurational hardening that we do around OpenStack, fundamentally a, 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 a job of editing config files into more proper configurations um, uh, compliant with, uh, with uh, reference architectures. Um, and in automating the deployment of OpenStack in optimized configurations using our Fuel engine. The nice thing about Fuel is that, uh, uh, is that uh, it enables deployment of OpenStack, which can be a many hours to many days long process if you work directly from sources, reducing it to uh, about an hour. So we produce the Mirantis OpenStack distribution. We do a great deal of training and, uh, and certification for IT personnel and developers in uh, OpenStack. Um, uh, by the way, our training is 100% vendor agnostic. We use, um, uh, we use DevStack, in fact, not Mirantis OpenStack in training. And, uh, and people like our trainings. I have personally sat through several of them, and they are – extraordinarily challenging. When you are certified by Mirantis, you really know your stuff. The courses, including our boot camps, are, are heavily uh, tested and, uh, and, uh, and uh, releases are granted uh, 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 grudgingly. There's really no fooling around with standards. We also have a large solution engineering division that uh, builds clouds for customers um, and uh, a, an associated support division that uh, uh, supports those customers um, with a standard enterprise class up to 24-7, 365 SOAs. Additionally, we have uh, a, uh, a hosted uh, version of Mirantis OpenStack, uh, nominally referred to as Mirantis OpenStack Express, that provides an easy on-ramp for people who are interested in exploring OpenStack, as well as a solution for people who want uh, a private hosted cloud solution as opposed to a public cloud solution as part of their, uh, their enterprise uh, continuum of cloud services. I talked a little bit about Fuel before. Um, fundamentally, that is um, that is the, the major distinguishing factor uh, beyond uh, uh, hardened configuration and all the plugins and drivers uh, about the Mirantis OpenStack distribution, which is otherwise essentially pure hardened OpenStack. Working with Fuel is extraordinarily simple. You install it on a virtual machine uh, from an ISO. Uh, it feels very much like installing a, uh, a Linux. You uh, click some buttons. Um, if you're doing a, a plain vanilla installation on networked hardware, it discovers all your hardware. Um, you perform some basic node assignments to decide what's going to be a controller, what's going to be a compute node, whether you're going to use high availability um, redundant controllers or not. And you press the deploy button, and you walk away and have coffee for about 45 minutes. And you come back, and you have an OpenStack cloud. Um, it is actually that simple. Um, and I've done it, geez, 20, 30 times now. Um, and uh, it works better and better with each revision. So I wanted to pass the baton uh, to Valentina, um, but first to talk a little bit about why um, networking is, is complicated in, uh, in OpenStack. Obviously, in a cloud environment, uh, you have apps and you have tenants um, that need connectivity and services. And they need, along with connectivity and services, um, uh, to be assured of isolation for both performance and security. Obviously, they don't want to read, you don't want tenants reading each other's traffic, but also you don't want tenants parked next to noisy neighbors and degrading each other's performance. You need uniformly high throughput um, and the ability to service um, uh, uh, network, uh, physical network configurations that uh, allow for redundancy and, uh, and, uh, and high performance regardless of the location of workloads. You want the ability to scale your physical infrastructure and your applications uh, smoothly, and you want security and metrics and the ability to comply with SLAs.
this is a lot of complicated stuff. And OpenStack all by itself provides for provides for abstracting this stuff in useful ways. You see this uh, illustration, for example, is a Cloud Foundry deployment that I was doing the other day. It looks very simple. It's a it's a gateway. And, uh, you know, it's uh, six or seven servers, including an inception server, that are sitting on a subnet. Um, the, the, uh, this is all happening, however, within a project which may have peer projects um, and, and top-level domains, and it's happening within an availability zone. And if I wanted to make this radically bigger, um, I would begin to run into complexity problems. Um, uh, uh, I would want a solution that went beyond the, uh, the, the, the APIs, the uh, simple scriptability, and the Horizon interface to manage this, uh, this Cloud Foundry deployment in a realistic way as, uh, as a production solution. As I said, OpenStack provides these basic services. There is a, a go-forward network control uh, orchestrator uh, and API called Neutron, which hides a SDN in favor of uh, simple abstractions that everybody knows about, like routers, gateways, and subnets. It supports various network models um, that use uh, VLANs and GRE tunnels and other uh, well-understood tools for, uh, for creating uh, virtual networks and isolating tenants. Um, it extends via plugins for things like load balancing, VPN as a service, uh, and it incorporates uh, uh, partner drivers to integrate specific SDN components. In uh, default OpenStack, uh, implementation. Uh, typically, we use Open vSwitch as the as the switching part. Um, but uh, but obviously, uh, production environments need uh, typically something more. Um, and with that, our uh, contribution here then is to is to talk uh, agnostically to providers of SDN and. Um, and to uh, assist them in uh, where necessary in creating the driver's plugins um, and ultimately fuel plugins to facilitate deployment of their solutions. We run certification programs that uh, assist in uh, testing and CICD harness construction and in, um, and in uh, assuring uh, themselves and ourselves that their solutions work well with OpenStack first and with Miranda's OpenStack second. Um, and uh, then we partner with leading SDN providers to support user choice and ultimately to simplify deployment and ensure customer satisfaction um, at uh, greater and greater scales. And with that, I'm going to hand over uh, presenting rights to uh, Valentina, who will tell you about PlumGrid. Thank you, John. All right, um, so we're going to switch gear a little bit and start uh, diving a little deeper into um, OpenStack uh, networking and then um, I'll tell you what PlumGrade does for OpenStack networking. Um, so just you know, um, adding up on what John was just describing, um, the network component for OpenStack is called Neutron, and um, and this was um, introduced a few releases back um, to really uh, enable both cloud providers and end users tenants to self provision uh, rich network services. So before you turn, um, networking was kind of built into Nova, the compute, um, the compute component of OpenStack. Um, and Neutron is really, uh, you know, the component that brings these rich network topologies, uh, the ability to configure, you know, security policies, to interconnect with the external world, provide this isolated environment, and so on and so forth. Um, now, <clears throat> With you know, with Neutron, users can really define their own networks, can define their own IP space, can define how these networks are interconnected with routers, um, and in, again, define policies and security, and define how their private isolated environment talks with the external world. Um, so this is you know, this slide here, it's um, and John showed it uh, earlier on as well. It's kind of a you know the the open stack representation of networks, um, and you can see it's very simple, very intuitive. Uh, and I'll walk you through a little bit of a demo later on. You'll see, you know, it's it's very simple to just use the um, UI of OpenStack to go through all these steps and creation. Now, what it's important to understand, and I think that's where uh, there's a lot of confusion, is that a Neutron was created from the get-go to be um, a plugin-based architecture. What this means is that Neutron doesn't really implement the network functionalities. What Neutron is, it's a, it's a very thin abstraction layer, an API layer, uh, exposes 
constructs like networks, you know, interfaces, subnets, routers, security groups to the end user. Uh, and in the backend, talks to whatever implementation of Neutron the customer decides to go and leverage. So this is a very fundamental point. So the backend can be VLAN based if you know, you're using a Neutron plugin that actually goes and configures VLAN on a physical network infrastructure. Uh, it can be overlay based uh, if you're using a solution like PlumGrid. It can be you know, a fabric controller when you're manipulating open flow in your underlying fabric. Whatever that is, that is really what implements the networks and the functionality the user is exposed to Neutron. Um, and so, you know, again, um, what happens if you're, for example, using an SDN solution, the, all the API calls and all the definition that you make through Neutron will be passed through all the way to the SDN controller that will then go and implement it. Um, there is kind of a, a default um, uh, implementation, which is based on open source components like OBS. Um, and that's where a network node, that's where usually people erroneously think it's Neutron, the Neutron implementation. Um, and this is usually what most, you know, most people out there start with. It's what it's, uh, you know, included in Mirantis and other distributions uh, as kind of the default component. Uh, now, OBS and the network node are, you know, a great starting point. Um, as John earlier on mentioned, um, when you start looking at how to scale your OpenStack deployment and how to grow and support production use cases, uh, the network is really the key building block that has to, you know, have the best level of performance, scalability, rich functionalities. Um, and so when, when you start with components like OBS and, and Neutron, um, and sorry, and the network node, there is some intrinsic limitations that you're going to uh, run into. Um, so this slide here just gives you an overview of, you know, what are some of the challenges and limitations of the model of OBS plus the network node. Um, if you're not familiar with the network node, uh, the idea there is that um, we use, you know, the network node, it's a, it's a central component like a server or a group of servers that are implementing the advanced services like NAT and um, you know firewalling, load balancing, and so on and so forth. So when you're leveraging an OpenStack deployment that has a network node, the traffic from your hypervisors will have to traverse your infrastructure and get all the way to the network node. Um, and obviously, the network node becomes a bottleneck because you're going to have to funnel all the traffic through that component, um, and you're going to have to start worrying about, you know, placement of the network node and how to make it highly available, um, and how to design it in such a way that if you scale out your solution and add more and more and more servers and more and more virtual machines, your network node doesn't break the entire solution. Um, so, you know, this is usually where customers start engaging with PlumGrid um, and, you know, they look for a solution that is fully distributed, they look for a solution that can scale with their needs, they look for a solution that has kind of the best level of performance. So that's where we jump in um, and I'll walk you through what we do to, to help there. And again, you know, to be crystal clear, what we do is we have a Neutron plugin, so we fit exactly uh, with this model that I've been describing so far, we fit within an OpenStack implementation and we augment, um, you know, the functionality that are available we use from, from the get-go. So this is a very, you know, quick slide on, you know, what PlumGrid Open Networking Suite is all about. Um, so let's start from the bottom up. So the first thing to, to know and understand is that we are an overlay-based solution. What this means is that we build on top of a physical, existing physical infrastructure. It can be any hardware. Uh, we have special integrations with specific components that I'll talk about in a second. That's why we mentioned everything cumulus here, but um, we can deploy on top of any physical infrastructure. We're overlay based. What that means is that we leverage some form of encapsulation directly from the hypervisor layer to decouple the existing physical fabric from the tenant infrastructure. Um, now, the, the reason why this model is very important is because you want to be able to offer isolated multi-tenant networks to the end users of the cloud without having to go and manipulate the physical infrastructure. Um, and, you know, we'll discuss more why that's important, but it's really a matter of minimizing changes in the fabric, keeping it very stable, and designing it not for isolation, but for performance, scalability, reliability. 
So um, on top of these overlay networks, what we do is we give customers uh, their isolated multi-tenant environments. We call them virtual domains, um, and we'll talk more about what the virtual domain is. But uh, in a nutshell, a virtual domain is a private, isolated data center that we can give to a user, an application, a tenant. And within this virtual domain, they can define their own network. Really imagine as if you were designing your own physical infrastructure, but now you can do it in this virtual space in software, um, and you can fully automate it. You can do it on demand, um, and you can you have all the flexibility of defining your own private IP space and you know whatever type of network configuration your application needs. Um, so virtual domains are really um, you know the, the the mapping point between your application needs. And, and the infrastructure within your OpenStack cloud. Um, so within a virtual domain, um, as I said before, you can um, define any set of network feature and functionality. Um, what is important to understand here is that um, if you're using PlumGrade in an OpenStack environment, what you're going to be exposed to is the default consistent OpenStack API and user interface. What this means is that you're going to be exposed to networks and subnets and routers and security groups. Um, and this is the same as if you were to use any other network vendor that has a Neutron plugin. Uh, what happens in the back end is we map those constructs on PlumGrid functionalities. Um, so what PlumGrid has is PlumGrid offers a portfolio of network functions. Um, from switching to routing to NAT uh, to you know, security. Um, and that's what we use internally to implement the requirements and requests that come from, uh, from OpenStack. We'll talk a lot more about the network functions, but uh, this is you know, giving you a feel for what we have in the portfolio. Um, now, how does somebody consume PlumGrid ONS? Um, PlumGrid ONS is integrated with all the major OpenStack distributions. It's OpenStack compatible and it's integrated and certified with all the major OpenStack distributions. <clears throat> and for those that have um, an automated installer like Mirantis, uh, what we do is we integrate within the installer framework so that it's easier for somebody to go and deploy OpenStack and then roll all the primary components on top of it. Um, so what we do is really helping from, a, from an operational perspective with you know, the deployment um, steps, making it you know, extremely smooth and straightforward to roll out all the pieces on top of what you already have in place. Um, and then help you through you know, the life cycle of your cloud with you know, very simple configuration, automation abilities, um, and very importantly, you know, something that John mentioned earlier, um, what we concentrate on is, on one side, giving you a very scalable infrastructure. So the ability to grow your OpenStack cloud and have the network grow with it. And the other important aspect is uh, that we have built high availability into every component of the system. Uh, and again, this is particularly important when you're running a large scale cloud environment. Um, so we make highly available all the components from the control plane, um, you know, to the, to the data plane and so on and so forth. Let's go a little more deep into, um, into the virtual domains. Um, and so what is it, what is virtual domain and why is this construct so important? Uh, and again, uh, this construct is something that our customers are exposed to kind of under the covers. Um, and virtual domains enable customers to build more advanced use cases than what can be mapped on just you know, basic Neutron API. So it's important to kind of get a feel for what a virtual domain is um, and how it can be used. And um, you know, again, uh, I'll give a glimpse of it in the, um, in the, uh, in the demo as well. Um, so virtual domains, um, give this isolated environment to, to tenants. Um, so when you define a virtual domain, you define what the network looks like for, for an application. Um, and you're also going to define which workloads will be part of this virtual domain. Um, now, PlumGrid has a very broad uh, platform reach um, in that um, as part of a virtual domain, we can connect virtual machines that are sitting on a KVM environment, we can connect virtual machines that are sitting on an ESX environment. Um, we can connect 
physical kind of bare metal workflow, uh, workloads as part of a virtual domain. We can connect, you know, container-based workloads. Uh, a virtual domain has this very broad reach of this, you know, uh, virtual network layer that can, you know, stretch and interconnect all these components smoothly connect together. Um, so uh, it's up to the user to define, you know, what the policies are to have, you know, which workloads be part of, of this virtual domain. Um, and the virtual domain construct, as I mentioned earlier, it's completely decoupled from the underlying infrastructure, given to the fact that we use, uh, you know, overlay technologies. Um, and virtual domains are fully distributed. We'll talk uh, a lot more about it um, on a couple of slides later. Um, this is just a table. I'm not going to go through all of it, but this is just a table that shows you all the network functions that Plum Grid provides as part of a virtual domain. Um, so, you know, switching routing, the ACP, uh, the ability to do NAT, um, um, the ability to do security policies, DNS, uh, PVLAN, as well as the ability to interconnect and compose virtual domains among each other. Um, again, this is, you know, very much advanced use cases, but this is something that every customer of our leverages. Um, now, what it's important to remember, if you have to have one takeaway from this slide, is that Plumgrid has a very broad and rich portfolio of network functions, and all the network functions that we provide are fully distributed. What this means is that um, well, we, we have a software component that we deploy within each hypervisor in the kernel, um, and through this software component, which we call the IOVisor, we make every feature and functionality that we expose to a customer fully distributed so that if you have two servers, your you know, network functions can scale across two servers. If you have 250 servers, your network functions will automatically scale across 250 servers. Um, so this distributed and scaled out architecture is really you know, the number one reason why customers look at Plum Grid in a, in a production environment. Um, scale out and distributed means performance, means simpler design, means you know not having to have bottlenecks. Um, so it's it's fundamental, and uh, this is something that um, kind of a default uh, Neutron uh, with you know OBS and Network Node does not support because only some of the functions are distributed while others are implemented through the Network Node itself. Now, obviously, PlumGrid um, cannot you know, boil the ocean and recreate every network function out there. Um, so what we do is we work with uh, partners to help our customers, um, you know, integrate and complement the virtual domain functionalities through their offerings. Um, this is particularly important for, you know, um, enterprise customers that already have service assets. Uh, they've made a purchase of, you know, firewalls and load balancers, you know, your Palo Alto networks, your F5s, and so on and so forth. Uh, and, they, and they now want to leverage them as part of a cloud offering. Um, so what Plumgrid does is we have, um, you know, a very pure play, open approach um, where we create an ecosystem around our virtual domains through a service insertion architecture framework that we have. Um, so we can very easily onboard third-party component as part of a virtual domain and expose it in a cloud automated environment. Um, so we service chain and stitch, uh, um, you know, which you know, load balancers, firewalls, and components into a virtual domain, um, and we make that available to the end users. Now, if we just dig a little deeper um, to give you a feel for how we make all these, you know, magic distribution and performance happen, um, there's kind of three pieces of the puzzle. Um, so the first one is what we call the Plum Grid Director. Um, think about the Plum Grid Director as the brain of the Plum Grid system. Um, it's always deployed as a cluster, so it's fully highly available. Um, and the Plum Grid Director implements all the um, control plane and management functions of the system. So it's the one piece that talks to OpenStack. Uh, it's the one piece that has a definition of all your tenant networks. Um, and it's the one that is responsible to talk into all, you know, to really the distributed system, all the data planes, all the compute nodes that are out there. Um, the second piece of the puzzle is what we call the Plum Grid uh, IOVisor Edge. Um, so the Plum Grid IOVisor Edge, um, it's, as I said earlier, it's a kernel module. Um, it's our, you know, we have developed these, um, this piece of, of software. 
Um, it's integrated within each hypervisor. It can be, and again, as I said earlier, it doesn't have to be just your KVM hypervisor. It can be, um, you know, ESXi as well. Um, and the IOVisor edge is really the point, the, the component that makes the distributed functions possible. Um, and so whenever you define um, your virtual domains, your networks to OpenStack, uh, what happens is the IOVisor address within each of the compute nodes will be the one implementing, you know, switching, routing, NAP, and, you know, security, and so on and so forth. Um, the IOVisor is, is being upstreamed. Um, so it's available to the to the community, um, and you know this is really kind of a you know a key component of of the solution here. Um, now the IOVisor Edge is what provides connectivity to virtual machines and containers. Uh, and we also have another flavor of the IOVisor, which is what we call the gateway. Uh, if you're familiar with overlay networks, uh, the gateway is always the component that um, maps from overlay to external network. Um, and so we have the ability to run this gateway function uh, in software. So it's just a server on which we deploy you know, an image. Um, we also have integration with um, you know, partners like Arista and others that provide physical switches that are VXLAN capable. Um, so really offering an array of features and functionality you know, uh, and performance choices whenever you uh, decide to deploy Plumgrid on it. So this slide is not going to work in this format here. Uh, we talked about it anyway. Um, and so what we do, as I said earlier, we map OpenStack networks to virtual domains, and that's kind of uh, you know the translation of the two constructs. Um, and I'll show you in the in the demo what that means. But uh, you're gonna through OpenStack, you're gonna find your OpenStack networks, and under the covers through our UI and our API, you can consume kind of the plum grid um, representation of it. Um, now, the reason why we have built virtual domains and give these representation is because uh, if you are operating a large scale environment and uh, want to know what your network infrastructure is doing, um, you need a lot more visibility and information than what OpenStack uh, default provides. Um, so through PlumGrid, our users can get very detailed information about you know, any interface in this virtual network, um, you know, packets flowing, drops, um, and you know we've also built uh, a very rich set of uh, tools, what we call Plumgrid Toolbox, um, that help monitor and troubleshoot in real time uh, the network infrastructure. Um, and so um, this is a kind of an important uh, operational component because the virtual network infrastructure, um, it's it's again the the junction point of your compute and storage is what provides connectivity and isolation. Um, and you want to make sure that you can proactively react to any, you know, problems or, you know, failures in your infrastructure. Um, so the way we augment um, the default, um, the, the default functionality available in Neutron is, you know, it's really adding these, um, these troubleshooting tools and monitoring tools and, and giving you a whole new level of, of visibility into your environment. Um, so this is the last slide, uh, kind of summarizing um, the architectural benefits of, um, you know, um, PlumGrid on top of kind of the Neutron uh, architecture, um, and so really the ability to have all the network functions be fully distributed. Um, so the VMs packet flows uh, never have to travel um, to any central location, uh, and then you know all the high availability and redundancy that is built in the system. Um, so when customers ask us, you know, why would I go with, you know, one flavor versus the other? I have a lot of customers that are, you know, still using Nova Networks. I have, you know, lots of customers that have been, you know, on toying with OVS and, um, and you know, they ask us, why do I move to, to PlumGrade? Why should I choose PlumGrade? Um, so really, you know, when you are in a you know, mission critical, large scale environment, there is needs for scalability, performance and, you know, feature set that uh, PlumGrade can satisfy. By. And then from, you know, from an operational perspective, operational angle, um, you know, all the tools and visibility that we have built on top of, uh, on top of our product, as well as all the um, automated installation uh, and, you know, simplified configuration, that's really something that, um, you know, helps bootstrap uh, the creation of a new business and simplifies the adoption of, of OpenStack. 
Um, so this concludes the presentation part. Uh, there is um, some links to documentation here. Uh, John mentioned earlier that OpenStack um, has a hosted environment that you can um, go and try out. Um, we offer as well um, a sandbox, virtual sandbox, as well as a hosted environment. Uh, it's called Plum Red Ignition, and you can check it out. The link is here. Um, both are great ways to um, get started with, you know, both OpenStack as well as obviously, you know, the network component of OpenStack. I can start the demo video, and then um, I see there's a few questions um, that we can, you know, address as well. And we, we don't have to go through the whole thing, uh, but just to give you a feel for um, uh, how things work. So this environment, it's a PlumGrid environment that was deployed on top of Mirantis OpenStack. Um, and uh, what we're showing here is just some very basic operations that uh, can be performed through uh, the OpenStack uh, user interface dashboard, what is called Horizon. So um, as you can see here, I'm logged in as a tenant. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going, just going to create a very simple um, network infrastructure. Um, you know, the, depending on the application you're running, um, this example here, I'm just going to create kind of uh, two uh, separate networks for my web and database tier. Um, and, you know, what I'm going to do through, um, through OpenStack here is to define my own private IP space. Um, again, because we're leveraging in the back end uh, an overlay solution, um, you can define any IP space that you want. Um, and this is your private IP space. It's completely decoupled from the underlying physical infrastructure. Um, and the overlay network takes care of, um, uh, you know, um, just isolating all of these information from, from the underlying infrastructure. Now, um, when you switch over from, um, from OpenStack to PlumGrid, um, you're going to have um, a slightly different, you know, visibility of, of things. You're going to see your, um, you know, um, plum grid representation where you have, um, you know, these uh, switches and um, virtual machines information and so on and so forth. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, in the plum grid view is where you can get all your more advanced, um, um, you know, uh, troubleshooting information, um, interfaces, information, um, and, and all sort of things that uh, are necessary to actually operate uh, operate the fabric. Um, and then some of our customers uh, leverage PlumGrid API directly to um, augment some of the OpenStack offerings. Um, so if you, you know, again, if you want to automate um, and have, you know, directly NAT configurations or other components that are not uh, present in OpenStack, they leverage uh, our API directly. Um, so here we're adding some uh, virtual machines to uh, each of the networks that I had created. Uh, as you can see, it's very straightforward. You launch a virtual machine and you select which network you want to use for it. Um, PlumGrid has um, uh, integration with the compute layer with Nova. So every time a VM comes up, we are aware of it and we can you know, provide and provision on demand the network infrastructure that, um, that this VM needs. Um, and then here, what I'm doing is, um, you know, now adding um, a router so I can interconnect my two networks, as you can see uh, on the OpenStack representation. Um, and similarly, you can see it on, on the PlumGrid representation. So we now have our router. Uh, we also have um, metadata services, which is more of an advanced um, component in OpenStack that we're not going to cover today. Um, but, you know, you see, it's, it's extremely simple to um, create and provision any type of infrastructure. So, um, you know, really cloud use cases drive this need for agility and, you know, provisioning seconds of the network component. Uh, and OpenStack provides this very, you know, um, flexible framework for you to, you know, expose this functionality to the users and PlumGrain in the back end makes all these features possible by, you know, making them distributed and available across the entire infrastructure. Um, and you know, extremely simple to to expose to the to the end consumer of the cloud. Um, so here we're just verifying that obviously you know virtual machines can connect to each other um, through the routing infrastructure. Um, the last piece of the puzzle when you deploy an OpenStack network is to um, have it talk to the external world. 
Um, so this ties back to what I was describing earlier in terms of um, gateway functionality. Uh, and in open stack network, the um, high level construct that is exposed to the tenant and the cloud operator is the construct of a serial network. Um, so the admin of the cloud will um, define this external network. Um, and what this means is that it's going to define kind of the exit point for a tenant onto the existing physical infrastructure. Um, so up until here, everything we were doing was in this you know, isolated private space. Um, I have my own IP addresses. I have my own topology. I can have as many routers as I want, as many networks as I want. It's, it's mine. I do all, whatever I want. Um, the exit point into the physical network is that it's something that is not controlled by the tenant. Uh, it's controlled by the admin. So the admin is the one that is responsible of providing this external connectivity, exposes it to the tenant, and then the tenant will be able to just you know, tell his own network, his own uh, router, hey, to exit from the infrastructure, use this external connectivity point that the cloud operator has given me. Um, so this gives you, you know, a feel for, um, for what we can do here. I want to pause for a second and you know, check and make sure um, how we're doing on you know, questions. And I don't want to go too long. I want to make sure that we have time for questions. Um, so um, just you know, kind of wrapping up the demo, I can leave it running in the, as we start addressing questions. Um, there's uh, some you know, videos around the tools that we provide and stuff. We can leave it in the background as we, you know, we start talking about what people ask in the Q&A panel. How about that, Azmir? That sounds, uh, that sounds great, Valentina. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's, uh, let's jump into a question. So, um, let's see here. There's a, there's a question uh, that came in from the audience, and it was about how, um, how Palm Grid ONS compares to uh, VMware NSX. And I actually would like to actually uh, zoom out a little bit and just, you know, as a general level, uh, how does Plum Grid compare to, you know, OBS-based solutions, you know, that, that, that leverage uh, OpenFlow? Absolutely. That's a great question. Um, so there is some key architectural differences uh, that I briefly touched upon when I was, uh, sorry, as I was going through the slides. But um, the way to think about um, OBS versus uh, the IOVisor is that um, OBS is, first of all, an open flow-based data plane. Uh, so what this means is that it was designed from the beginning to uh, be able to you know, satisfy open flow um, uh, rules and be able to match packets based on specific uh, rules and fields. Um, now, OBS and anything that it's leveraging, you know, OBS, so you know, obviously uh, NSX and other products, um, what that means is that there is, um, there's always a need to punt packets to some either user space or controller component um, whenever there's no entry for that packet. Um, so the first, the first consideration is that the performance of such an approach is such that um, some of the, most of the time you're going to have to punt packets somewhere else to resolve what you have to do with that packet. So kind of that's the first um, limitation of that approach. Um, the second limitation of really any data plane is not just obvious compared to the IOVisor is that um, any data plane out there is hard coded to provide some set of functionality. Um, and so when you hard code a data plane to provide some set of functionality, um, what this means is that if you evolve um, and you start, um, you know, um, uh, you, you need to add more functionalities, you need to now add security or, you know, load balancing or whatever else, and throw that into the mix, um, you need to go and modify completely your data plane. So usually what that means for a consumer of this technology is you're going to have to go and patch your data plane, um, you know, have a complete reboot of your cloud, and you know, uh, it's going to take quite a long time also to develop this new functionality. Uh, the IOVisor was always designed from the get-go to be extensible at runtime. Um, so the IOVisor is a flexible data plane where we can load network functionalities as needed. Um, so it's a big fundamental architectural difference there. And, and I think what, one thing that you and I hear about, you know, I, I know Marantz is called, you know, pure play, open stack player. I think, you know, Palm Grid gets called as the no agenda SDN player. And really, I think that speaks to how open we are relative to the kind of open stack distributions that we're integrated with, Marantz being one of them. Um, and then also the um, the types of uh, uh, hardware and virtual appliance and Docker containers that we can ingest into our fabric 
and make that available as a as a network function. Um, so I think you know I think Correct. that's a really a key differentiator for us too relative to VMware NSX, where that tends to be you know uh, tends to be something that's fairly focused on on either particular use case or particular infrastructure components that that limits you in terms of flexibility in this era of cloud where there's a lot of moving parts. And so we we tend to take the pragmatic approach that says look we accept all comers and really try to try to help customers sort of go from where they are right now to where they need to go in the future, make it really extensible, very very flexible. Uh, but that was a great question. Uh, I'm going to pass it on to John now. Hey, John. So, um, how does Mirantis OpenStack support highly available and distributed storage? Um, well, there are a couple of solutions that uh, that Mirantis OpenStack supports out of the box. Uh, you can, uh, when deploying a cloud with Fuel, uh, make uh, a decision whether to use uh, OpenStack legacy uh, object storage uh, uh, system Swift. Uh, or switch to Ceph, and you can selectively determine whether to use Ceph or Swift to provide uh, just object storage to your cluster or both object and block storage. So you can make all of your storage uh, distributable. Uh, um, uh, in addition, uh, we recently released in a sort of an uncertified state a cluster FS plug-in for fuel that makes it possible to easily deploy cluster FS uh, equivalently as uh, as distributed storage uh, anywhere you want distributed storage in an OpenStack cluster. So pretty pretty broad. Um, uh, I, I guess uh, alternative solutions would, uh, would require a little more manual integration at this point, but we're always adding new stuff. Got it. Excellent. How about um, how about migration? Obviously, you know, their uh, uh, customers are using virtual machines today in a non-OpenStack environment. How much work is it to migrate applications to OpenStack and take advantage of this new modern architecture? Uh, I, I guess that's for me again. Yeah, um, I guess that's for you. The um, the uh, this is an interesting question right now because last Friday closed a an OpenStack Foundation project, uh, a book sprint project, to create a definitive. A book out of the OpenStack community on creating applications, architecting applications for OpenStack Cloud, um, and this was uh, done by uh, by a bunch of volunteers, uh, including um, uh, Mirantis, uh, uh Nick Chase, uh, who served in an editorial capacity. Um, it was uh, it was uh, uh, conducted in Taiwan, um, but uh, but uh, with uh, participants uh, remoting and helicoptering and skyping in from around the world. Um, and I would expect that inside of two weeks or so, that book will actually be available in draft form, uh, probably free of charge, um, as uh, uh, as earlier book spread uh, books like the Architecture Design Guide uh, have been. So if you really want the definitive answer on community-wide, this is how cloud apps should be architected, best practice stuff, um, please get that book. Um, in the meantime, um, First off, uh, OpenStack, and in particular Mirantis OpenStack, because of our partnership with people like VMware, um, is moving into a position to support multiple hypervisors. So if you absolutely positively need um, uh, your, uh, your ESXi uh, hypervisor to support your um, uh, HA-dependent uh, 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 um, legacy applications, uh, you can have that and you can have your OpenStack APIs as well. Um, uh, I guess you would call that a zero portability solution. There are um, importing stuff to KVM, um, which is this more, you know, the, the open source sort of native preferred, if it's possible to say, um, uh, hypervisor for OpenStack. Um, you're looking at needing to provide um, um, uh, HA as a you know as a software solution, um, which the OpenStack community tends to do with its own components via HA proxy and RabbitMQ um, uh, for load balancing and uh, and uh, and uh, 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 systems. Uh, 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 there's a uh, there's a, uh, a standard practice that segregates stuff to availability zones and uh, and uh, you know so so minimizes points of failure uh, within a, a a cluster and uses these open source tools to 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 balance and uh, and uh, determine which um, uh, to arbitrate master slave uh, active passive passive kind of configurations um, a lot of apps do that already web native apps tend to um, if you're working with platform as a service solutions moreover like cloud foundry 
um, the 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 HA uh, uh, is is uh, is something that you can dial in in the in the abstraction of the platform. So you don't really have to worry about it at that point. Um, ultimately, it's easier than you look, except in specific use cases where it turns out to be complicated. And uh, there, there are uh, some. Um, OpenStack, uh, open source, I should say, uh, projects, projects closely associated with OpenStack, like uh, Pump House, that uh, facilitate, for example, extraction of AWS uh, workloads. I know that Eucalyptus uh, did some work uh, extracting AWS uh, workloads and has powerful solutions. So there are point solutions to solve most of the use cases that people will encounter in migration. Excellent. Thanks, John. Um, I think we'll take one more before we end the webinar today, and this this goes to uh, Valentina. So. You know, can can the can PlumGrid um, the Neutron plugin run concurrently with plugins from other networking vendors? Right back to the question around being being flexible and open. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, we have done, you know, um, also work in you know integrating and certifying with other components. In particular, I gave you a flavor of um, you know our service insertion architecture, and that's one area where we see PlumGrid working very closely with with our partners that are leveraging, for example, you know, load balancer as a service or, you know, firewall as a service extensions to, to Neutron. Um, and so certainly, you know, PlumGrid has a very open approach and uh, uh, we work with other components to provide a complete stack solution. Excellent. All right, I think uh, that's all the time we have today. Uh, thank you uh, everyone for uh, joining the webinar. Thank you, John and Valentina for the great presentation. Um, as I said earlier, we'll go ahead and post the recording of this webinar here in the next uh, next week or so. Um, and with that, I'd like to end it, and uh, I hope everybody have a good day. Thank you.